This week in lab, we're going to be doing the second chapter of taxonomy, and everything today is in the domain eukarya, so complicated cells, large cells, they have a nucleus, and all those other membrane-bound organelles. Um, everything today is also going to be in the same kingdom, and that would be the kingdom plantae. So what makes a plant a plant? So I already said eukaryotic. All plants are multicellular. Um, all plants, well... Not necessarily all plants are photosynthetic. The vast majority of plants are photosynthetic. However, there are some plants out there that are parasites of other plants and don't carry out photosynthesis for themselves, at least not to the degree that they could actually make all of their own food. So they're stealing something from somebody. One of the characteristics for them is all of the plant cells are gonna have a cell wall around them and the cell wall is gonna be made out of cellulose. So remember from last week, fungi also had a cell wall, but they made theirs out of chitin. Also, plants, as a typical rule, don't get up and walk around, so they have a fancy word to describe that, and that would be sessile or non-motile. They don't move around. Um, this plant right here is just a reminder. Not all plants are wonderful, happy foods or things for us. Some plants are toxic to human beings. Now, this is poison ivy. Toxicodendron radicans is the species name for them. Not everybody is allergic to poison ivy. For example, I had a job one summer where I had to traipse around Fort Hood counting plants after a crown fire had come through. And even though I touched poison ivy all over the place, I never broke out in a rash. Every single other person in the group did, but I didn't. And so I am apparently not allergic to poison ivy. Um, however, there are a lot of people that are, and just touching this plant can set off a fairly nasty rash that tends to weep and is very itchy and very unpleasant. You tend to have to get steroids to make the rash go away. And so if you don't know what a plant is, again, don't touch it unless you know that it's something that's safe. There's another plant that grows in our area that's called nose burn. And if you touch that one and then happen to touch your face, it will do exactly what its name suggests. It's kind of like getting tear gassed, but up your nose if that's where you happen to touch. So just don't touch it if you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, botany is the study of plants. For a lot of my biological career prior to teaching, I was a botanist. I, I would go around doing plant surveys in different places uh, using quadrants or just um, tapes to, to see what was kind of growing around the tape. There are some that just go out and look for different species and then mark them. So this is actually at the Fort Worth Botanical Garden. And this plant right here is the Silver Dollar Maiden Hair Fern. And a botanist is the person who made that label and then put that label up. And so botanists are people who study botany, essentially. From there, we're going to start getting into the phylum. Phylum bryophyta or bryophyta. I really don't care which way you say it, although technically it should be bryophyta. But what makes these plants unique is that they are almost exclusively teeny tiny plants at this point, And that's because they do not have any vascular tissue. Um, where our vascular tissue is like arteries and veins, plants have xylem and phloem. Xylem takes water from the roots as the roots absorb it from the soil and then transports it through the rest of the plant. Phloem goes in the opposite direction. So you can sort of think of xylem like it's northbound and phloem like it's southbound, if that makes you easier to remember or it makes it easier to remember that fact anyway. So that is what vascular tissue is, and this group does not have that. That means they can't move water around in their body very well and they can't move food around in their body very well. So they have to stay really small because they're relying on diffusion to do that movement for them. Now we do get mosses here in Texas, but I took this picture while I was in Hawaii and all the stuff that's on the surface of the rock, that's all moss that's growing. There are some ferns in the closer area up here, but all of this green stuff is all moss. And so that would be something in the phylum bryophyta. The example that your lab manual gives you for this is sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss is something that is used in horticulture, which is when you grow plants basically inside. Um, so this is something you could just go buy at Walmart or whatever grocery store you happen to go to. And it's a potting soil. And what a lot of people don't realize is potting soil is not really made out of what you might think of as dirt. Like there's not clay in there. There are probably not all that much silt in there. There could be sand in there. It kind of depends on what plant you're trying to grow and what soil you're trying to grow them in. But this is just the basically cut up dead remains of the plant that was sphagnum moss. This is what it looks like when it's alive off over here. So this is just dead cut up that. Mm -hmm. Next, phylum chlorophyta. So I am mentioning this because, again, taxonomy is always in flux based on new evidence, but this used to be considered a protist. 
because it doesn't have true tissues. It doesn't have leaf stem roots. In fact, it doesn't have anything even sort of kind of like roots for that matter. Um, and so this is new to the plant kingdom. Based on DNA evidence, it really does belong in the plant kingdom, but I want you to understand it's a very primitive plant. It is full-on aquatic. It can only live in the water, and most of the time it's only living in salt water, like marine-type environments. Um, still no vascular tissue. It can't have vascular tissue because it doesn't have tissues, so can't do vascular tissue if you don't have tissues. Um, a lot of people just call this green lettuce, but its genus name is Ulva, and so this is what Ulva looks like when it's still alive. So green algae, essentially. Rhodophyta, that name literally means red algae. Again, this used to be a protist. Now they've moved it on over into the plant kingdom, but again, it doesn't have true tissues. So again, no vascular tissue. But if you see a specimen that is red in color and looks sort of vaguely plant-like, it's going to be in the Rhodophyta phylum. Lycopodiophyta has always been in the plant group. This is our first group that is starting to get some vascular tissue, but they don't make seeds. Seeds is something that only more advanced plants are capable of making. This group relies on spore formation. A spore is a type of asexual reproduction where, like, you don't have to get two cells together to make a spore, and a spore can just land in soil and grow into a new plant all on its own. So we don't need fertilization. It's just an easier way for plants to reproduce that doesn't rely on needing a second cell to come in and help that process out. Now, this is not something that I've, I've been all, all over Texas from as far south as you can get to as far north, as far west, and as far east. And I have not seen Lycopodium growing in Texas naturally, but it's kind of a big moss. It gets taller. And then it has these little structures. You can't see it in this picture, but you can in this one when they've bloated up blown it up. <laughs> Sorry, blown it up. They have sporangium, which are these little sort of, I don't know, peanut looking things between what's known as the axle, which is the leaf coming into the stem. So that's a sporangium. That's a sporangium. Here's another. There's another. That's the structure that actually makes the spores. Okay. Polypodiophyta. This has always been a plant group as well. This one does also have vascular tissue, just like the last one did. We still don't make seeds in this group. But this is one that is a little bit more easy to recognize. Most people recognize a fern because it's a very common house plant. We do get this growing in Texas. This is a picture that I took at Enchanted Rock, which is sort of down by Fredericksburg. If you've never been, I kind of think everybody in Texas should go to Enchanted Rock at least once in their life because it's just really pretty. But living up in some little pools in the rocks towards the top, they have communities of life that exist only there and no place else anywhere in the world. Not just here in Texas, but no place else in the world, including some of these little ferns that are growing up over here. So these ferns would be in the phylum Polypodiophyta. Now, one of the other things it mentions is we still have sporangia. You won't always see these on the presence of leaves. They only do this when they're trying to reproduce. But all these little brown spots on the backside of this frond, each one of those little spots is a sporangium. And then just an FYI, we don't call these leaves and ferns. We call them fronds. So this whole entire thing is part of a frond. Over here in this picture, this is a frond. That's a frond. So no leaves. They have fronds. Cycadophyta. This is a group that... Um, Cycads belong in. Cycads are something that are, again, used fairly commonly as a landscaping plant. If you've ever heard of a sago palm, it belongs in this group. In fact, that is a sago palm right there. They are not very good outdoor plants here in Texas because if it freezes, they will die back. Um, so if you've ever driven around and you've seen people that are like covering their plants with sheets or trash bags or something in the wintertime, it might be a sago palm that they have planted in their yard because they do not like the freeze. The freeze will kill them. Um, so this is our first group that does actually have true seeds. They don't cover their seed with a fruit, though. So they have what is sometimes called a naked fruit. Ginkophyta. There is only one species that is still in this phylum, and that is ginkgo biloba. You may have heard of that because it is an herbal supplement that you can buy over the counter at just any old store anywhere. It is usually marketed as something as a memory aid. Um, so if you've ever taken a ginkgo biloba, you've taken the ground up leaves of this plant. Your lab manual mentions fairly easy to recognize the leaves because they're fan shaped. So this is the up close of the leaves. 
This one is just, uh, it's actually a tourist attraction, I think over in China, but when it, the fall comes, it is a deciduous plant, so the leaves are gonna fall off, and so it just looks gorgeous around there. After, I'd hate to be the person who had to break them up, but it is really pretty to see them when they've lost their leaves. Pine offida, hopefully that makes you think pine trees, because pine trees happen to belong in this group. Um, anything that makes a cone belongs in this group, so think pine cone. Cedars do make cones. They tend to not look like that. They tend to look more like berries to a person who doesn't know any better, but they actually do make cones as well. Um, let's see, sequoia trees like the giant redwoods out in California, they belong in this group. Around here, we also get something called a bald cypress. It belongs in this group. Most of these are going to be evergreens. They keep their needles, which they usually have needles or scales instead of full-on leaves, but they tend to keep them all year round. The exception to that is the bald cypress, which is called that because in the winter it becomes bald and it loses all of its leaves. Um, the lab manual does mention there's three different kinds of pine cones that can be present on a tree. Two of which you should recognize, but the other one you really only notice it if you're actually paying attention, and that's the staminate cone. Staminate cones are called that because the male portion of a flower is called a stamen. It produces pollen. Now, this is not a flower. However, this is trying to make you think stamen pollen production, and that's what this does. It is a pine cone that is specialized for pollen release. If you were to go up to this and flick it, a huge cloud of yellow dust that is just nothing but pollen would come out of those cones, and so these are all staminate cones. They're really small. They're like the size of a finger knuckle. Um, they're really fleshy. They're not woody. So again, most people wouldn't see these and think, hey, look at those pine cones. But that is what they are, technically. Then you have ovate cones and you have mature cones. The difference between these two is this is that after a year. So an ovate cone has eggs inside of it, and those eggs can be fertilized by the sperm and the pollen of this little guy once it gets up over there. Once we've been pollinated and then fertilized, the scales in this pine cone will open up and then it will become mature. So this is, you can kind of think of it as this is what an unfertilized pine cone looks like and this is what a fertilized pine cone looks like. Phylum Magnoliophyta is the biggest group in terms of plants that are still alive to this day. It is a newer group um, in terms of evolution. They are also some of the most complex plants that are out there. They do have flowers for their reproductive structures. They do enclose their seeds in fruits, which are not always edible, but they do always have something around them. And then I just also wanted you to know that this group is also called angiosperms. So um, this is some daisy-like thing off over here. The purple one is a morning glory. The blue one is sometimes called a widow's tear. It's in the genus Comalina. It's a very common weed that you can find, but they're really kind of pretty if you look at them up close. And so there's a bunch of different kinds of flowers in that picture, and they're all in the phylum Magnoliophyta. Next up, you're supposed to learn the basic structures that go along for a flower. So the stem that supports a flower isn't called a stem, it's called a pedicel. And so this little part down here is the pedicel. At the tip of the pedicel, you get this swollen part to it, and all of the floral structures are going to be attached to that. It's called the receptacle. From there, botanists consider there to be potentially four different whorls of tissue. Each one of those whorls has its own little separate name. The calyx consists of sepals, if they're present. Sepals are usually green and leaf-like, but not always. Um, next up, you get the corolla. The corolla is made out of multiple petals. Petals are usually brightly colored, but not always. Next up, you get the male whorl of tissue. It consists of stamens, and stamens have two parts. The tip is the anther, and the stalk that supports it is called the filament. And then the central whorl of tissue is the female structure. It's called the carpal. So all of this green stalk in the middle is the carpal. Sometimes in middle school and high school, they'll call it the pistil, but it's called the carpal. The carpal has three parts, the stigma, the style, and then at the base, you have the ovary, and the ovary contains the ovules. The ovules have the eggs in them. So keep in mind that this entire structure is basically the sex organs of a plant. We've got the male structure, which is going to make pollen, which has sperm in it. And then we have the female structure, which is going to have the eggs inside the ovules off down here. Everything else is designed to help reproduction in some way. If they smell good, they're trying to attract something to come and pollinate them. If they look pretty, 
they're trying to get somebody to come pick it or brush up against it so that they can disperse seeds or something. But the petals and the sepals usually don't play a role in reproduction. Um, and by that, I mean they don't play a role in fertilization and then egg development. They can end up becoming part of the fruit if the fruit ends up having accessory structures associated with it. Okay, some terms that apply to flower parts. If a flower is complete, that means it has all four whorls. So it has the calyx, the corolla, the boy parts, the girl parts. If it is incomplete, it's missing at least one of those parts. So I mentioned earlier that some plants don't have sepals. Well, this is a lily. Lilies do not have sepals. They do have petals, they have stamens, they have a carpal. So they are incomplete though, because they're missing the sepals that would have been off over here. Now, perfect and imperfect is just about the boy and girl parts to a flower. Perfect mean it has both, which a lot of plants are technically hermaphrodites. They have both the male and the female parts in them, including this lily. Even though this lily is incomplete, it is perfect because it has both stamens and it has a carpal. These flowers up over here, if you've ever tried to grow a squash or zucchini, this is what the flowers look like for those. And these guys have boy flowers and they have separate girl flowers. I'm trying to remember, it's been such a long time since I've grown some of these. I think they do have sepals, but it's hard to tell because they're open but I want to say that structure right there is going to be the sepal of another flower that comes up. So I think they do have sepals. I, uh, you can see the petals pretty clearly, but because this one only has stamens and no carpal, it's incomplete because it's missing a reproductive structure and it's imperfect because it doesn't have the carpal. This one, same thing. It's incomplete because it's missing the boy parts and it's imperfect because it's missing the boy parts. And so a perfect flower can be incomplete but if something is imperfect, by definition, it has to be incomplete. There are two broad groups that can be found within the um, phylum Magnoliophyta. These used to be um, sometimes subphyla, sometimes superclasses. It, it kind of, again, the taxonomy is sort of in flux on this one. But monocots are a group of flowering plants that have one seed leaf. A seed leaf is called a cotyledon, so monocot means one cotyledon. Um, the flowers for monocots are going to tend to have flower parts and multiples of three. So this is a different picture of a lily. If you count up all the petals, there's six petals in that flower. There's six petals in that flower. That's a multiple of three. And so that tends to make it a monocot. Now, I don't remember if I said it earlier. I'm sure it was on the slide, but all angiosperms do have veins or vascular tissue. They have xylem and phloem, and you can actually see them better on this particular plant back here. So this light green line, that's a vein that runs through the leaf. If all the veins are parallel to each other, that tends to mean that the plant is a monocot. It is like that on the lily too, but for some reason the lily leaves on this plant are sort of furry looking and it's it's hiding the vascular tissue in that one. And so it's a little bit more difficult to see that. But this plant, same thing, parallel veins. Fibrous versus taproots. If they're fibrous, they kind of all spread out from the base of the plant. If it's a taproot, think carrot, like it has one big root that goes down and then just little bitty roots that come off of that one big root. Dicots. They are named based on the fact that they have two cotyledons. That's what dicot actually means. Um, they tend to get net veins, and for that I'll show you the rose up over here. So the rose leaf is actually more complex than you think. This is just a leaflet. That is another leaflet, and those are part of one big leaf. But this main vein that runs down the length of the leaf, that's just one, and then we have other veins that branch off of that. That's called net veination. And so this plant has net venation, or branched veins is another way to say that. A lot of dicots have tap roots, and the flower parts tend to be in multiples of two, four, or five. So this is a Hoya plant. If you count up all the little flower parts, it's got five petals, and so that would mean that that's a dicot. Now you could count all the petals on a rose if you wanted to. The primitive ancestor to a rose had five petals as well, and so it would also be dicot, not just the veins tell you that, also the number of flower parts get you them. So they want us to, on page 304, look at four different flowers and then try to use some of the terms that they gave us for this. So this flower I pulled from the peach tree that is in my backyard. So the name of flower number one, peach. 
number of petals. So just pick one flower and count how many petals that one flower has. Doesn't matter which one, they're usually going to have the same number, but there's five petals on this. You can see the sepals in between the petals. So that's a sepal. There's another one, two, three, four, five. So there's five sepals on this plant. Then we start to get to the things that are a little bit more difficult to count. So this is a domesticated plant and it has a ton of stamens. So each of these little pink stalks is a filament and then either yellow or green on the tip of it, that's the anther. So this is one stamen. There's a bunch of stamens in each one of these flowers. So what I'm going to recommend that you do instead of sitting here and counting every single one of them is just put many. Number of carpels. This is a carpel and this is a carpel. So there are two carpels in this peach flower right here. Um, are there any parts missing? Well, again, what we want to think of is those four whorls of tissue, the calyx, the corolla, the boy parts, the girl parts, and this has all of them. And so no, there's no parts missing. If there's no parts missing, that means it's complete. If it's complete, it's got to be perfect. Is it a monocot or a dicot? Okay, well, to answer that one, you have to go back to, well, does it have multiples of three or does it have multiples of two, four, or five? Everything here is basically the two, four, or five. And so this is a dicot. Peaches are dicots. All right, different plant from my backyard. This one is called American Beautyberry, and it's a lovely shrub that birds actually really love if you have. It makes either pink or red berries, depending on which strain you get of it. And the birds will just sit out there and eat the berries and have a lovely time with it. Um, we're going to go ahead. You can pick any one of the flowers that are on here, but just pick one and let's count it out. So I hate that they make you kind of flip back and forth as we're labeling these. But flower number two, American Beautyberry. Number of petals, four. Number of sepals, okay. It can be difficult to tell when the flower is open. This is a spent flower, this is a splint flower. The sepals are left behind, but the petals have fallen off. And if you count those up, there's four sepals as well. Number of stamens, okay. So that's a stamen, that's a stamen, that is a stamen right there. Um, there should be another one in that flower, but I'm actually only seeing those three. So three stamens. Number of carpels. Let's see, I'm looking for the best one. Okay, this flower has the best one. It's this little greeny structure going on right through here. So one carpel. Are there any parts missing? Nope, it had sepals, petals, boy and girl parts. So it's complete, it's perfect. For is it a monocot or a dicot? It's got the two fours or fives, and so this is a dicot. You can also see a little bit that we have veins that are branched. So branched veins is another piece of evidence that we have a dicot. Next up, this is one of my favorite wild flowers. It starts to bloom, depending on the weather, like in February or March. It's called a showy primrose. So the name for flower number three, showy primrose. Number of petals. Should be pretty easy for you guys to see in this picture. There's four. Number of sepals. This one is kind of complicated because it has a sepal that sort of twists around the flower. So we're just going to say two to make our lives simple. You can't see it in the picture. You're just going to take my word for that. Number of stamens. So remember the anatomy of a stamen and then you guys try to count that for yourself. I know I'm giving you a long time to count to try to make sure you're doing the work for yourself. There are eight stamens in this flower. A couple of them are actually hiding back behind here, but there are eight stamens. Number of carpels, that's this star-shaped thing that's going on right here. There's just one. The stigma just branches into those four little chunks. Are there any parts missing? No, so it's complete, it's perfect, and the four petals tells us it's a dicot. Last one that we're going to do. This flower is from a pomegranate bush. They do grow in our area, so if you've ever wanted to grow a fruit for yourself, try a pomegranate. Uh, just side note, they do have thorns, so if you don't like wooden thorns stabbing you when you try to pick a pomegranate, maybe don't plant it. But pomegranate. Number of petals. So pick any one that you think you can count on, and how many petals does it have? 
answer is five. Number of sepals, it's again kind of hard to tell when the flower is open, but this is the flower before it opens and that doesn't have any sepals. Well, it's not going to grow them after the fact, so no sepals. Um, number of stamens, this is another one where you can just say many. Carpels are in there, many. Parts missing, yes, it's missing the sepals. So that means it's incomplete. However, it does have both of the reproductive structures, so it is perfect. Um, since it has five petals, it is a dicot. Almost everything I gave you there was a dicot, wasn't it? Or was everything I gave you there a dicot? Man, I should have given you some other examples, but I was just trying to pick pictures that I happen to have. So there's those little guys. Okay, next up, questions one and two. Pause your video, get the answers. Um, table two is really just kind of a summary of everything that we have done in this chapter. Um, question three has three parts. So this is part one, part two, part three. And then this is number four, which is your anatomy and physiology of the flower parts. Number five is up here. Number six has multiple parts to it. And here are the answers to number six for the second one. So again, pause the video, get what you need. All right, critical thinking. Genetic engineering has been used on many plants, usually to produce more food, to make more nutritious food, or be better able to withstand plant diseases. How does it work? Well, we talked about genetic engineering in the first half of this class. We talked about gene cloning. And if you took my class, we even did a little activity where you did a recombination, where you took the gene for human insulin and you put it into a bacterial plasmid. It's the same process here. It's just now we're putting things into plants instead. What are some advantages? We can give a plant any trait we want it to have. One of the most early plants that was genetically engineered was something called golden rice. Golden rice is a plant that they gave a gene from a tulip to. The tulip makes beta carotene where the rice can't. Beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A. So that could cure blindness by helping people get vitamin A that weren't getting it in their diet originally. What are some disadvantages? Um, I gave you the two kind of big ones up there. People tend to not want to eat things that are genetically engineered. Um, I, I, I still sometimes get this muffin mix. It's a brand called Martha White. And Martha White started putting on their packaging um, whether or not the food that was in it was genetically engineered. And when they first started to do that, their sales actually plummeted because their flour was made with plants that had been genetically engineered. So then they had to resource it to get their sales back up so that they could print on their thing that it was grown without genetic engineering. So low public approval. Um, there is the potential, and this is again something we talk about in the first half of the class, but if you give a plant resistance to a pesticide, there's a possibility that you could end up creating quote unquote super weeds, which are weeds that are also resistant to that pesticide. And so that is potentially problematic. You could potentially spread allergens, allow invasive species to spread. They're like there's a bunch of different things that may happen. The only thing that we have really seen happen at this point is problems with bees. Um, and it's not because the plant was genetically engineered. It's because after we genetically engineered the plant, we sprayed it with more pesticide and the bees don't like pesticide. All right, number two. What are organic fruits and vegetables? Well, organic has a straight up definition by the USDA in relation to food sources. And what it means is it was grown without synthetic fertilizers and no chemical pesticides were used in the process of growing that plant. So essentially nothing bad was sprayed on the plant as it was growing. How is quote unquote organic different from genetically engineered quote unquote? Organic is only about those chemicals that are applied to the plant while it's growing or being harvested or being stored. So you can have genetically engineered food that is considered organic because it was never sprayed with pesticide or anything like that. So again, most countries are now saying you have to label food genetically engineered if it has been genetically engineered. Number three, many fruits are seedless. Grapes, watermelons, bananas. How do seedless plants reproduce? Asexually is the short answer to that question, but I gave you some more answer up there. Number four, how does a tree make annual rings and what is different about the ginkgo biloba tree since it doesn't make rings? Well, okay, trees make annual rings because of a structure that they have that's called the cambium. It's just underneath the bark of the tree. The cambium is the actively growing part of a tree and it's the reason why if you girdle a tree, the tree will die. It's because you killed its growth area. 
Um, the cambium is also what allows material to move up and down the tree. So by cutting that, you've cut off its circulatory system, and so you kill it that way as well. Um, so here's kind of the issue with this question. The cambium tends to grow faster when the weather is nice. So in spring and summer, it grows fairly well. In the winter time, when the leaves are gone, though, it can't grow as well because it doesn't have as much food available. And so since it grows less, you get a denser, thinner ring. So one annual ring consists of a thin ring and a thick ring. I have not ever seen a ginkgo biloba that has been cut. I did do an image search online, and what I saw is that ginkgo biloba does have rings. It doesn't necessarily mean they're annual rings, however. Um, we have cedar trees here in this part of Texas. They don't do annual rings. They just grow whenever they feel like growing. Since they're evergreens, they can grow consistently all year round. So just by cutting a tree, you couldn't tell how old a cedar tree was. And that might be what's going on with the ginkgo tree as well. Um, I kind of wonder if they didn't mean to ask about cycads because they specifically mentioned in the lab manual that cycads don't do growth rings like that. So I'm really... I'm not sure enough about ginkgos. I've never been around a ginkgo. I've never grown one for myself. They're not from here. They're from Asia. So I don't know what it's deal with. Mm. Number five, a Venus flytrap is a carnivorous plant. Does it do photosynthesis? Yes, it does. It's still a green plant. It still has chlorophyll. It does still make its own food. However, most carnivorous plants grow in nitrogen poor soils and you need nitrogen to make proteins and nucleic acids. And without that, the animal or in this case plant would die. So the reason that these plants eat animals is to get the nitrogen from the animal that they're eating. Not to get carbohydrates, they can make that for themselves, but they need that nitrogen and so that's what the dead things are going to be for there. Um, how does it catch insects? You can watch the gif in the bottom. Basically, if an insect triggers what's called a trichome inside the leaf of the Venus flytrap, it makes water move real fast to close the leaf and snap it shut with the insect being trapped inside of it. I love the last question there. Does it chew its prey and swallow it? No, it's not an animal. It can't chew like that. That cracks me up that they thought they needed to ask that. But um, what's going to happen after it closes is it's going to start to release enzymes into that little pocket that it has created and then kill the animal and very slowly digest it, it like the pit of what is that pit from Star Wars that's slowly digesting and then absorb it directly through the leaf. But no, it's got no stomach. It's, if it swallowed it, there would be no place for it to go. Um, why do plant leaves change colors in the fall? Short answer is they recycle the chlorophyll. And so you start to be able to see all the other pigments that have always been there, but were hiding behind the chlorophyll. Um, so plants tend to make several different kinds of pigments so that they can absorb more wavelengths of light so that they can do photosynthesis better. It's just that the chlorophyll is present in much higher quantities. And so you usually see that one. But when sunlight starts to wane away and trees start to think, well, we might as well just close up shop for the wintertime, they first recycle that chlorophyll component and then you're able to see the carotene and the xanthophylls and all those other pigments that had always been there in the background. Um, what plants are toxic to humans? Well, I already mentioned the poison ivy earlier, so you got that one. Um, there's a plant that grows in South America called strychnine. If you eat that, you'll die pretty quick. Castor beans make ricin, which is a poison for humans. Different people also have allergies. And so for some people, peanuts are toxic to them. It kind of varies person to person, but there's a bunch of plants out there that can make something that is toxic for you and you should not eat it. Um, cats and dogs have a lot of overlap. Like notice lilies pop up in both of these. Lilies are not a good plant for you to have in your house if you have cats and dogs and they tend to get into things. Poinsettias, those are toxic for cats. If they eat that, they will die. And so again, not a good plant to have in your house if you have a cat that likes to nibble on stuff. The sago palm, which is a cycad, notice that one pops up on both groups. And then from there, I also wanted to specifically mention grapes. There are some fruits and vegetables that it's perfectly okay to feed to your dog. Like you can feed your dog a little slice of banana and that's perfectly fine. My dog, if you were to walk into my house with an apple, 
she would steal that apple from out of your mouth and then run away with it and have at that apple. And that's okay, although she really shouldn't eat the core, but neither should people for that matter. But grapes are toxic to cats, or pardon me, to dogs. And so do not ever feed a grape to a dog unless you want a really high vet bill because you have poisoned your dog. I also left chocolate off of that list because most people know chocolate is dangerous to dogs. It is. Um, another little warning that I wanted to give you in relation to dogs specifically, um, because Americans are so, how do I want to say this and be nice? Oh my goodness. Um, we desire food that has a high fat content and a high sugar content. A lot of the companies that make peanut butter are starting to add sugars to their peanut butter or sugar alcohols. Xylitol is a sugar alcohol and it is highly toxic to dogs. Um, the same reason that you should not give your dog or allow your dog to chew some sugar-free gum. Um, you should not let your dog eat peanut butter that has xylitol in it. So please be careful if you do give your dogs peanut butter. Check the ingredient list and make sure that there's no xylitol in there because it will kill your dog. All right, at this point, you should be ready to take the quiz on plants.